Hello, I'm Henry T. Gosh, it's good to be here every morning with you. That's a little twist to my schedule. I thought I was busy before. Now I'm inundated with busy with a capital B, but I love it. It's what I love to do. There are so many inspirational stories in the state of New Mexico, and I need them all. And I know that you know one, you're uh, kind of keeping it hidden, bring it out to the forefront now and share it with Henry T. So together we can share it with the whole state of New Mexico. Over a million people get to see this station every day in New Mexico, Colorado, Arizona, and Texas. And this show can inspire all of us with all these great stories. It's nothing I do in particular. It's our good Lord in heaven, St. Henry T. We got some stories today that are gonna make everybody feel good. So we give the glory to him and we tell the story right here on this powerful TV station. So I need your help. Again, 505-884-8355. Be inspired with Henry T. Help me get more and more of these great stories. Would you do that? Amen. Well, since we last talked, you know, Lobo football is coming off that heartbreak loss to San Jose State. Now they need to put it back in that win gear again. They want to achieve a bowl game. So that's at the front of their mind right now. A lot of Lobo fans are pulling for them too. But one of the big things is they need you to go buy a ticket and fill up University Stadium and watch the Lobos on Branch Field. Would you do that? The Cowboys and the Broncos are keeping me busy on Sunday. I have fun with both teams, and uh, maybe one of these days will be so lucky that I go up to Denver or to Dallas and do an inspirational story with some of those players, and I intend to do that in the near future. Well, I tell you what, we have a really good guest coming up. It's a guest that really inspired a lot of people the last time we showed this, this story. It's kind of a repeat, yes, but I tell you, you can't see this story enough times. It's telling a story about a friend of ours, Eddie Gallegos, a corpsman with the United States Marines, as he assisted his soldiers on the front lines in Vietnam. We'll tell that story and you'll meet Eddie Gallegos up close and personal right here when we come back. Funding for today's programming has been provided in part by A and D Heating and Air Conditioning. Hi, my name is Aaron and I am the owner of A&D Heating and Air Conditioning. I am an avid listener of Channel 32, and this is our brand, A&D Signature Series. A&D also provides repairs, new installations, evaporative to refrigerated conversions, and other services. A&D Heating and Air Conditioning, 505-489-9342. Thanks for supporting family programming. Hello again, I'm Henry T, and welcome to the show. It's called be inspired with Henry T. Everybody gets inspired, but mostly Henry T, because my guests, they sit right here, and I'm that close to this inspiration that gets me so fired up. Man, I'm happy to be here, and happy you're here today. To meet a longtime friend of mine, former football teammate of mine, who has an incredible story to share with you. Ladies and gentlemen, my pleasure to introduce to you my close friend, longtime friend, Eddie Gallegos. Eddie, how are you? Just fine, Henry. How are you? Man, I'm healthy, I'm happy, and so pleased that you've joined me here at KZQ TV today. My pleasure. Wow. Thank you. You have a story that is so compelling. I don't want to waste a second without getting to you. You're on stage, and you have a story to tell right out of high school after being an incredible high school football player, many described you around me as the hardest hitting football player that Sandy High School 
ever had. Well, Let me give you five on that first. That's a shock. <laughs> no, well, not to me. Yeah, it was a shock when you got, when you hit us. <laughs> well, thank hey, you. After high school, you had an idea. You wanted to go pursue some goals and dreams. Let's take it right there. You are on stage to tell your very dramatic story. Well, after high school, I went to University of New Mexico, and I was fortunate enough to test out of UNM with 18 hours of F, and so I decided to join up the service, mostly to have a place to stay and some food. We used to call it three hots and a cot. So I joined up after the university said, you can't come back because you failed every class you took. <laughs> so wow. I just played a lot of pool. <laughs> I went to class on occasion anyway. <laughs> so after, uh, it was on December 7th, 1964, when I was informed by the university that I was not going to return unless I came back with some sort of a dedication and inspiration to actually study. Uh, and I would say to you, I was not what you would call dedicated. Uh, anyway, on December 7th, because it was Pearl Harbor Day and my father had been in the Navy World War II, I decided to go down to join. I joined, uh, that morning I woke up in my apartment and I was with, in my days I partied a bit and all over my apartment floor were some of my friends who were uh, sleeping and beer cans and soda pop cans and cigarette butts all over the floor and uh, it was cold and I was behind on the rent <laughs> and I, uh, I was working part time but it, I decided not to go to work anymore because I was having a good time playing pool. So anyway, I woke up with these friends of mine and they uh, were all asleep. So I went to look for some food, no food. Uh, I had to go to the restroom, uh, no toilet paper. So I decided to go, uh, went to the, uh, join the Navy. So I joined the Navy so I could see the world and I wouldn't, and I could have some place to eat and sleep. And the thing about it, and I went down and I said I couldn't, um, I couldn't go for two weeks. I could sign up, but I had to wait. And during that two weeks was the first and only time, thank goodness, I was homeless. I couldn't live in the apartment anymore. So I used to sleep in people's cars in the gym at the university and uh, go to the restaurants nearby the university. And when people leave their table with leftover food, I'd go and grab it. And that was my chow. Finally, I went, went to boot camp, got out. And I was assigned to go to school at U.S. Naval Hospital Corman School, uh, which was basically to train how to be a nurse. So I became a nurse after six or seven months going to school. I went to Jacksonville, Florida, at the U.S. Naval Hospital, and I did a lot of nursing with people who were just returning from Vietnam. This is in late 1965, and I, we started receiving Marines, because as you may know, the Marines are part of the Navy. They're not a separate branch, so these um, Marines were coming back broken, and they started to tell me about the war. So a friend of mine, Tommy Morgan, who was a Highland High graduate at 64, we decided to, ju to volunteer because we didn't like Florida. It was too human, too much jungle. Hardy, har, har. <laughs> we said, we're going to go to the jungle to get out of the jungle. Anyway, so we joined up. And uh, we volunteered, and two days later, get a call from personnel. They didn't know how to say my name. They said, Galigas, your orders are here. Okay. And I put in a dream sheet, San Francisco, New Orleans, New York City. Said, uh, uh, 3rd Mar Div, 3rd Marine Division. I said, what's that? RVN, what's that? Republic of Vietnam. Uh, okay. <laughs> so, anyway, I went to Camp Lejeune, North Carolina to learn how to be a combat medic. Flew from there to Okinawa, where I went to confession, because I was going to go into battle with a clean soul. And I prayed a lot that I was not going to be hurt, but I prayed and went to confession. And then uh, eventually ended up in a place called Da Nang. And uh, we were there two, two or three days, waiting to go. I do recall a meeting a Marine who was on his way out. And he said, hey, Doc, where are you going? I don't know. And I was wearing a Marine uniform because I was a Navy corpsman attached to Marines. Well, I don't know. He said, well, I hope you don't go to the Ninth Marines. Why? Because they call them the bloody stumps. They're getting in a lot of combat. Okay, I hope I don't go either. Next day, Ninth Marines. So I called Ninth Marines and got in a Jeep and drove way down to the jungle. And uh, this Jeep had machine guns on it and, and Marines with guns. <laughs> 
my heart was starting to pound. Anyway, after about two weeks there and some, some uh, how can I say, warnings, I do remember that some Marines would tell me, well, do this, do that, watch out. And the last I remember is they said to me, hey, Doc, we all corpsmen up in a firefight, you come up. Okay. And if you don't come up, you know what's going to happen? No. We might get a new doc next firefight. Well, okay then. <laughs> so I, anyway, May 14th, 1966, we're on patrol at a place called La Tobac. And it's a little ville where we've been in a lot of combat before. And uh, La Tobac is a giant plane like a metal. And in this plane are uh, checkerboard type of rice paddies. Each rice paddy is about the size of a football field. And in between the rice paddies were tree lines, basically jungle, separating the, tree, the uh, paddies. And so Sergeant Okuna, who was a World War II and Korea veteran, said, we're going to have to cross two men at a time. So we're crossing two men at a time. And there were 28 men in our platoon that day. Half the platoon was on one side of the rice paddy, and the other side was, and we had to cover those who were running across. When it came to my turn, I was running across the paddy at a real fast trot with another guy next to me. About halfway through the rice paddy, everything exploded. Machine guns, big guns, little guns, explosions, boom, 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 bam, bam, kaboom, tack, 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 boom, bam. And uh, the whole place was just erupting. So I was pretty scared, naturally. And uh, I heard ahead of me, maybe 50 yards, Corman up, Corman up where the firefight was on, the hottest. So I got up, and the guy next to me, I don't think he needed my help anymore. I couldn't tell. I think he was dead, but I'm not sure. He didn't need me, I don't think. So I started uh, running. I got up maybe about maybe 10 feet. Bam! Right here. Hole in leg. Mm. Ooh, that hurt. So anyway, I'm still I hear screaming. God, they're cussing now. Get your so-and-so over here now. So I got up. Got another, maybe another 10 feet, bam, hit again, same leg. And I was thinking, this is, this is gonna be bad. So this time I took off in my football. I just ran like hell, even though I was hurting. And the, it was bleeding so bad here, I could hear it squishing like when you put your shoe in uh, water, you hear it going squish, squish, squish. <laughs> but I said, I gotta get there. So I got there, and just as I got to the tree line, boom, I got hit in my right buttock, and I, and I started really, thinking this is not good. Anyway, when I got there, there was a guy named Craig Horton who had been hit in the leg. Uh, he had, no, he had a, a calf, uh, no bone, I mean a bone, but no meat. And he was in pain, so I, I started working. By this time, I could barely move because my hands were shaking. So I was wrapping him up and gave him some morphine. And when you had to put a morphine, you had to put an M on their head. So if you give him morphine and you have to tell, and they don't know in the back, they get him again, it could kill him. So you have to make sure that the other people know he's got morphine. So I put him up and I, and I told him what to do. And I said, here, take the rifle and start shooting. Because <laughs> he, he could still shoot, just having his leg didn't work. And uh, anyway, I look, I, he, then this other Marine, and we're like in a little berm in this tree line. And this other guy says, hey, Doc, look. So I reached over like I'm facing you. And I started working on him. And he had one arm he could use, the other one was not wounded. So I'm working on his arm, and he knocked me down with his good arm, like this, and right here about maybe, maybe 10 feet behind me. He killed two of them right behind me. Right there. I mean, I watched him die right there. And oh, wow, man, I was getting all, this was really getting bad. So uh, after he killed those two, I, I, I heard other people yelling. Then I saw this guy named Watson, he was an M79 man, so a sawed-off shotgun that shoots a grenade. And he says, hey, Doc, look. And he held up his fingers, and his thumb was gone. I said, and I grabbed him, I grabbed him like this, and just as I grabbed him like this, he got it right in the head, died instantly. Somebody said, here they come. So I grabbed the rifle from Murphy, because he wasn't doing well with one arm. And from, I'd say, maybe, maybe 10 yards away, maybe 20 yards away, three enemy soldiers, North Vietnamese, not VC, North Vietnamese, much more difficult, hardcore, and they're killers, coming at me. So I got that M14 with uh, a whole round in it, clip, 20 rounds, shot him full of Matic, missed him. I should have hit him, but I was pretty scared. 
And as I, as I missed him, I was turning, and then there was a giant explosion right next to me. And I wasn't wearing a helmet, and I wasn't wearing body armor. It was just too hot. And when that thing went off, I could feel the metal going into my body. It went into here, my side. It went into my arm, went to both legs, and into my head. I, st I couldn't believe it that I was still alive. I was still alive. So uh, as I'm looking at myself uh, and I'm trying to fix on people, I don't remember this part, but later on I was told I was continuing to help people out, despite, as they said, the wounds I was going to. Eventually, I had to lay down and rest because I was losing a lot of blood. So I laid down next to Watson because he didn't have a head. And I, I, I got next to him because I thought we were going to get overrun. And I figured if I snuggled up next to him and played dead, that they would, they would uh, maybe pass me up. Because I later found out our 28 man, man patrol was attacked by an estimated force, and this is many years later, in what is called an after action report. We were 300 and between 350 and 450 enemy soldiers against our 28. So they were all over the place. I mean, everywhere. So I snuggled up to Watson real close. And um, anyway, to make a long story short, I made it back and recovered. I spent a year in the hospital. And people asked me um, ah, what, what was happening. The day, that day, I think I was going to die. And you know what? I felt real calm. I actually heard angels singing. And I saw my grandmother, who died many years before, to whom I was very close. And she, she was a very devout Catholic. So I saw her. I heard the angels singing. And I was peaceful. When I got back to Da Nang, I got the last sacraments. So I was peaceful again. I said, I'm going to die, and that's OK. I'm going to make it. And so fortunately or unfortunately, depending, if you know Eddie Gallego, some like me, some don't. I lived, I, I lived, and I was medically retired at age 20 from the military for medical reasons. And when I was in the hospital, I saw a lot of other people die. And I had made a decision that it was my obligation to return. <clears throat> and to uh, honor my survival and those who died, not um, never quitting. And, as Sandia High School coach used to teach us, never quit. And I can tell you this, when I was in that rice paddy, when that tree line waiting to die, I could have given up, I think, but I said to myself, I can't quit. And so this day, to this day, I'm grateful for that because I returned, I got to go to college, I went to law school, I practiced law for 30 years. I have two beautiful, wonderful grandchildren who love their grandpa very much. So anyway, now that I'm retired, I spend a lot of time taking my grandchildren, and I'm so grateful <clears throat> that God gave me the second chance mm -hmm. to live. And so that's my story. What a story. <laughs> How do you feel today? A great well, career in law, yeah. and everybody loves my friend Ed Gallegos, ladies and gentlemen. Two kinds of people in this world. Givers and takers. He's one of the givers, one of the greatest givers I've ever met. Thank you. And today you give inspiration to the entire state. Anyhow, I love you like a brother. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for being here today to well, share thank you that very much. incredible story. Well, I appreciate it. Wow. Ed Gallegos. For today's programming has been brought to you in part by Marty Sice, a local State Farm Insurance agent. I am never getting married. Never. Guaranteed. You picked a beautiful ring. Thank you. <coughs> We're never having kids. <laughs> I love it here. We are never moving to the suburbs. 
We are never getting one of those. We're never having another kid. I'm pregnant. I'm never letting go. Marty Size, 345 3431. Thank you for supporting family programming. Hello again, I'm Henry T. And a couple of weeks ago, we watched number 10, Austin Apodaca, be literally put into the game. Coach said, Coach Davies said, Austin, two minutes left in the game. I need you in there right now to help us win this game. Austin ran out on the field, two minutes left in the game. Lobos need a touchdown to beat Hawaii. Hawaii just missed a chip shot field goal and the door was open for victory for the Lobos. Coach Davies said, Austin, get in the game. Number 10 ran out on the field and then number 10 led his Lobos on an 80 yard drive and he threw a touchdown pass to complete the drive. Wow, what a close to that football game. Let's find out from Austin to recall those exciting moments when coach went to him and said, Austin, get in the game, go win the game for us. Here's Austin Apodaca, number 10, the new quarterback for the New Mexico Lobos. This is an inspirational show. Cool. What you did the other night was inspirational to you, your teammates, and to everybody in this house, and everybody across the country that watched that. People love comebacks, huh? <laughs> You've been a part of many. But this one might have been the catalyst comeback for you for many reasons. Mm -hmm. How did it inspire you first? Well, you know, it just gave me, um, you know, I remember going into the, the drive, the final drive there and just thinking, you know, what an opportunity, you know, what an opportunity from God to glorify God. And uh, I remember that it being my exact thought and, you know, like, man, that's a great situation that I just put in. Some people could look at it, you know, haven't played all game and you haven't done this and you're not warm and everything. But I felt like um, it was a huge opportunity for me and I felt like it wasn't an interruption at all. It was opportunity. Wow. How did it inspire your team? What happened at that moment? You threw a tight spiral with velocity. It was adrenaline on that throw and gambling. He <laughs> stumbled. Yeah. It was all there, but he made the catch. But there was a feeling out there. Can you convey the feeling? in the huddle before the play. Yeah, um, in the huddle before the play, you know, it's first down, we just got a huge conversion out of Carlos on that catch on the sideline over there on the comeback, which is a huge play, like I said. Um, and then in the play the, in the play call in the huddle, um, <clears throat> we called it and I knew that we had a chance just because it was first down, we were taking a shot. Uh, we still had a good amount of time left with almost a minute left. Um, pump fake to Carlos, the safety bit way over the top. See Gambo running free. And I just, I'm like, wow, this is really it. And I throw it to him and and I get hit pretty hard and I look up right when I'm on the ground and he's running in the end, for, in the end zone for a touchdown. It was a real exciting moment for all of us. Yeah, that moment is precious. Yeah. It's a moment in time where it's not even Shakespeare can describe it. How do you describe it? Oh man, it's hard for me to even describe. You know, it's hard to, it's hard to describe to other people because you can only, it's kind of a how you had to be there moment. You know, when I was on the ground after I just got hit and I'm just looking up from the ground seeing Gambo basically almost crawl into the end zone, stumble into the end zone. I knew we, I knew we had it won, and that was just an unbelievable feeling. You know, uh, going down there 80, 80 yards and in whatever it was, it was a, it was an unbelievable feeling, indescribable. You know, you have to be ready on every snap. You never know. You're the next play up. Mm -hmm. You're the next man up. You've been ready. You've been supportive of your, your teammate throughout. Yep. I mean, I love that support. That's team oriented support. But then you got the call. But you were ready for that call, were you not? Absolutely, yeah. And, uh, you know, I got the call uh, earlier on. And then uh, so I was warming up on the bike and getting my arm loose. And, you know, we, they lined up for the field goal. They missed it. And I was like, oh, my goodness, this is really going to happen. We're, we're about to go down there and drive and win it. So it was a huge opportunity, like I said, for me and for the whole team. Yeah. And, you know, in the first answer, you gave glory to God. Do you talk to him while you're on that field? 
Uh, yeah, I mean, like I said just before that, you know, just praying. Thanks for the opportunity and uh, just trying to glorify God throughout the whole throughout the whole process. You know, I knew that um, it was it was for a reason that I was going out there, and and uh, it wasn't it wasn't going to be for no reason. So I was excited about it and just trying to give glory to God the whole drive. Well, everybody in here was standing and cheering, and some people crying. <laughs> Even the press box where you have to be reserved, they were standing and hollering too. The angels in heaven were doing backflips. <laughs> Are you aware of that? <laughs> I wasn't, but uh, if I could have seen that, I'd be really, really excited to see that for sure. What were the first conversations like with your family? Oh man, it was exciting. You know, my mom, my dad were here, was here. Uh, my grandpa, my uncle, um, had a couple cousins. You know, it was it was an exciting time. So uh, I'm really glad they got they got to see that too. They've been supportive of me my whole life, whether I'm playing, whether I'm not, whether I'm successful, whether I'm not. So uh, you know, it's good. It's good for that. I remember uh, right after that, just looking up at them, and they were just cheering, and um, it was a great moment. You know, you're a very selfless player, and uh, it's easy to be selfish in this game with all the super egos we see on TV and yeah. all of that. Where does this put you? I heard Coach Davies say publicly yesterday, "You've earned the right to play more," mm -hmm. and I hope it's significantly more. How do you feel about your next opportunity? What's happened that Coach Davies' words are being put to fruition? Yeah, I mean, I think it's just the same for me. I'm going to treat every opportunity the same. You know, this is an opportunity for me, like I said, to better myself and to better the team. So um, whatever my role is, whether I'm the starting quarterback, whether I'm not, I'm going to go in there with the same attitude. You know, I, I didn't play it down before the two-minute drill there, and I just felt like, you know, I felt like on that drive, let's go. If I'm going to, if I'm going to do this thing, it's going to be to win it. You know, it's not going to be for no reason and it's not going to be with no effort so uh you know i attack every opportunity with the same mindset um i'm going to get better and, and better my team and uh if people doubt that's okay they can doubt but they'll see in the near future so two more questions austin it's moments like that that can be a catalyst of inspiration not only for you and the fans but more important for your team you've got more games ahead mm -hmm. that moment could have lifted up your team to go win them all now. Yeah. Is it that kind of a moment? Do you feel it? Did you feel it in the locker room? Yeah, oh yeah, it was, it was a huge moment. And, uh, you know, um, I don't want to take too much credit because, um, you know, it took a, it was a team win. It wasn't just me behind there and uh, behind the win. It was a it was our whole team, and you know, I think it was good for our whole team to see that we can finish and we can fight. You know, we were down nearly the whole game, and uh, we came back. It took us to the last minute and a half to win it, but we won it, and that's the that's the main thing. And so I think after the lock, after the game in the locker room, we were all excited for the for the remainder of the season and and how big of an opportunity we really have. How good a team can you be? I think we can be a really good team. You know, uh, I think we are a really good team. I think we have a lot of potential. I don't think we've ever, I don't think we've played our best game yet still to this day. Wow, what a story. What a moment in time for Austin to be inserted in the game and find Gammon with that wide open, what, 22 yard pass for a touchdown? Wow, that's one of those moments that is gonna inspire you to go buy a ticket and get into that stadium to help this Lobo team reach a bowl game. It's been great talking with you today, right here on KZQ. Remember, we're on every morning right here. Be inspired with Henry T. Eight o'clock every morning right here on KZQ Channel 32. See you tomorrow. you got a story, don't forget to call me with it, 907-4523 or email original game face at gmail.com it's been great talking with you today right here on kzq remember we're on every morning right here be inspired with henry t eight o'clock on kzq channel 32. funding for today's programming has been brought to you in part by Malloy Dodge, Albuquerque's new and used Dodge and Ram truck dealer since 1955. I'm Nick Malloy from Malloy Dodge. For four generations, we've been serving thousands of New Mexicans from all across our fine state. Over 65 years of trust. Our family serving yours. Malloy Dodge, we're proud to stand behind our community. Thank you for supporting family programming.